My specific research is related to the area of irregular parallelism, but today I'm going to take you all the way from the basics of why you'd want to do parallelism, what regular parallelism is, and then the challenges that we see in irregular parallelism. And I'm trying to emphasise to all of you why, no matter what your field is and what sort of software you're working in, why you'd be interested in these techniques and how we're going to use them in the future. So why do you want to write parallel programs in the first place? Most people are taught to write sequential programs first, and doing parallel programming is something you might get taught, a technique you might use every now and again, but it's not something most of us think to do by default when we're programming. It used to be the case that all computers had a single CPU, run all the code sequentially. And it's been like this for many decades, so it's informed all of the way we write software, all of our education, all of our techniques and ways of doing things. We're very used to thinking sequentially, and it's a nice comforting place to be. Everyone knows what they're doing on a sequential system. So we've tended to try and stay there. There were some systems in the past that have had two CPUs, so expensive servers, some specialist systems might have had two CPUs. But it's only an extra CPU, so if you ignore it, it doesn't matter particularly. Um, and generally, if you had two CPUs, it's because you wanted to use them specifically to do something. So again, most people didn't worry about um, dealing with two CPUs in a single computer. The problem we've had that is we, as we've advanced processor technology, and added more and more transistors and made them more and more tiny inside the CPU. We've used more and more elaborate systems to get more performance out of our processes. We're starting to hit a point where we can't put any more power into the system. We've only got so much power you can put into CPU because we can only draw so much power, we can only get rid of so much heat. And we're drawing more and more power to create these more elaborate CPUs with these tiny transistors. And it's not working anymore because we can't shove any more power in to achieve that. So this graph shows the, the number of transistors in processors over time, which just keeps going up and up and up, and this is a logarithmic scale, mind. But the amount of power that we can put into a CPU is limited. We can't stick much more in. And starting around 2004, we start to hit what we call a power wall. This has meant that the clock speed of processors can't go up any further, because we can't put any more power through the processor, so we can't use the clock speed any higher. And that's caused the blue line, where again, around 2004, the clock speed stayed the same, we couldn't put any more in. And this has meant that the processors aren't getting any more powerful. They may have more transistors in, but in terms of how fast you can actually run your programs, your benchmarks, your applications, you're not getting any more, any more out of it over a single processor. It's likely that we'll still get some performance increase over time, but the key difference is you're not going to get that exponential increase of uh, Moore's Law, giving you more and more performance again and again and again like we used to. We used to be able to build program how we like and just think that the next generation of processors will take that performance slack up for us. That's probably not going to happen on the same scale as it used to. So the way around this is to put two processing cores in a single processor. It's different to having two CPUs because you have the same heat and power budget. It's integrated into a single package so they can share cache, they can share the memory bus. So it's not the same as having two CPUs. Um, it's a much more efficient way to get the same processing power. Um, of two into a single processor. But again, this is pretty easy to deal with. You can simply run one application in the foreground and one in the background, or run a couple of background tasks, or you can just ignore it and you're not really using much. However, that process has continued. So my phone typically has two cores, most phones do. My laptop's got four cores. And here you could run a couple of background applications perhaps, but you're starting to think, what am I gonna do with that fourth core? And as this process continues over time, you can start to see how the problem exacerbates. When you've got 16 cores, which is probably something we'll see in the very near future, you start to very quickly run out of ideas of things to put on these cores. If your application is running on just one of them, what are you going to do with all the others? And they're there taking up space. And the key thing as well is that if you add more and more cores, we've got the same space, the same power budget, they might start getting less and less powerful on their own. And eventually, some people may think we end up with hundreds or even thousands of cores. And that's some of the research we're looking at here at Manchester. And if we have thousands of cores, what on earth are you going to do with them all? The danger is, if you have a sequential application, it's going to end up running on some tiny little corner of your processor, ignoring all the power that's got around it. And this applies no matter what your applications are made. If you're writing software for modern processors, you're going to end up in this situation if you're not writing parallel code. So that's why we want to do it in the first place. We do already know how to make parallel programs. We've been doing it for 30 to 40 years now. Um, it's not something new, 
When people talk about parallelism as if it's come from nowhere, the logical revolution it has it. We know lots of good techniques already. All you have to do is structure your program so you've got tasks that can run at the same time as each other. So two tasks, at least, which can run at the same time, doing their own thing, making their own calculations, then you've got parallelism. That sounds really straightforward. Sounds really easy. So instead of your big sequential program, split it up into lots of tasks which run alongside each other. We can run them in parallel by sticking them on separate cores. And if you can create as many of these tasks as possible, then we can fill up some of those cores on these potentially huge multi-core processes. So a really good example is matrix multiplication. It's a good example because it's one of those traditional scientific operations that you were using things like weather processing, large linear algebra systems, the sort of thing where you'd want to have a parallel computer. And that's why you're good at it, because it's where the money's been in the past. So matrix multiplication, for each cell in the matrix, you use a column from one of the input matrices and a row from the other, and that informs the results of one cell. And then the next cell in the matrix has different inputs, and it calculates its own value. But the key thing to know is that each cell in the matrix is entirely independent of the, any other cell. And therefore, we've got tasks which can run in parallel. All we have to do is separate those out, and then we can run them on different cores. This is a really good solution. You can have very, very large matrices in some problems, and you can parallelize those pretty easily. Now, there are some issues still about how you schedule them and about where you move the data around. But in terms of creating the parallelism in the first place, it's pretty straightforward. This only works if those tasks are entirely independent of each other, as they are in matrix multiplication. There needs to be, ideally, no communication between them. And if they all, they need to be able to run so they're not using the same memory, ideally. So each of these tasks needs to have nothing to do with any other tasks. So there needs to be nothing moving between them. They need to not stop each other. And then you'll have enough, as much parallelism as we need. The problem that you might find is that you create a choke point by having some kind of shared object. If you have some sort of object in your program that everyone wants to use, and I don't mean a jar or just mean any kind of conceptual object, if everyone wants to use it, then you may find that everyone goes down into this one object and then they have to wait to use it. And if you're familiar with parallel programming, you might have used locks before, and this is the sort of problem that locks use. And the things become serialized as they all try to go through this single object. And you can imagine if we try and schedule that onto different cores, you're going to end up with that problem where you had lots of cores and only one being used. This is where you get that problem from. One point in your program where everyone's trying to use it at the same time. And you may think you've got all these tasks, but in reality, if they use a single shared object, then you're going to have one task, perhaps for a significant amount of your program. Ideally, obviously, don't write software with choke points in the first place. You can avoid it for lots of scientific applications. But perhaps there are some problems where you can't avoid writing these choke points. And what are we going to do about those? It's traditionally been the case that this is what they're running scientific parallel computers um, and solving big problems on these sort of computers. So this is what people think of when they think of parallelism. They think it doesn't apply to them. But in reality, with these massive multi-cores, you've got that kind of parallelism potentially going into your single computer um, over the next few years as we get more and more cores. So you're operating this kind of machine that they at the moment they have specialist programming and specialist running on your own for your application. Even if you're writing something nothing to do with parallelism, you're trying to manage and program this sort of computer. So let's look at a tricky problem. And this is a problem which I'm looking at intensively in my PhD, and it's designed to be really awkward. Um, but it's not something I've just picked out of the air. It's a, a real problem. So this is called Lee's algorithm. It's an algorithm to solve the problem of circuit routing. On a printed circuit board, we have lots of the black dots where components connect to the board. We'd like to join them together by building wires. And the, the colored lines represent those wires. And you can see that there's lots of wires, and they all crisscross each other. And they're allowed to go over the top of each other, and it costs a bit more, so you'd like to try and avoid that. But um, generally, the wires, the wires cross the entire board, and it's a bit of a rat's nest of a, a problem. If we zoom in, you can see the kind of complexity. If you pick out a, a single line and follow it with your eyes, you can see it's going under other wires, around others. The shape that wires take depends on the shape that other wires have taken in the past. Now, the exact algorithm for working this out isn't particularly relevant. It's a, a simple breadth of first a search. Um, but what I want to point out is the kind of intercomplexity between the different routes. 
And this should be ringing alarm bells because we said we wanted our task to be independent. And you think about starting to pick out routes from here, which are independent of each other, so they can be solved in parallel, you can start to see where the problem is. So if I pick out one route, it goes from one of these black dots where some components are connected to another, and there's already wires on the board. So in order to get the, the cheapest cost, the least wire, it already moves around in a slightly funny way. It's quite hard to work out why it's doing that from looking at a single wire. It's as the program builds up, you get to this state which forms where a particular wire will go. And then if you have another wire we'd like to solve at the same time, the problem is that it, it crosses the other wire. So it's going from where it thinks it wants to start and finish, it looks at the best route and it tries to use the same bit. So you've got something that's being shared between the two. If we tried to run them in parallel, they'd overwrite each other's memory, we'd end up in a big mess. What we have is a conflict, the two tasks are getting in each other's way at this point in the middle. However, the really tricky thing is that you don't know where the routes are going to go until we've started trying to solve them. So all we know at the start is we've got these black dots and we're going to try and link them up. And that's all the information you've got. You can try and use some heuristics, but in practice I found that routes are so unpredictable where they go, any kind of heuristic is not likely to be useful. So you end up with a problem that the, the thing that the task conflicts over, the thing that they try and get each other's way with, is basically anywhere on the board. And so you can see that massive shared object is instantly going to cause that problem of a conflict where everyone tries to go down through the same object and use it. So it looks like we can't find any parallelism. And this is a really annoying problem because of thinking about how the algorithm works, it should be really easy. There should be loads of routes you can solve in parallel. And if you knew what solutions to the routes were, then you could make it in parallel really easily. But you don't know that stuff beforehand, so you can't solve it in that way. The entire board ends up being one big shared object. No matter how many tasks you create, they end up going through either one choke point or in reality a few choke points, but still enough to really constrict how much parallelism you're getting. And this is what we'd like to try and avoid. We're calling this an irregular problem. We can't divide up the shared resource and so it stays as one big awkward shared resource. And that contrasts to the, the regular parallelism, things like matrix multiplication. So how can we tackle this? I'm using this quote as inspiration. This is Admiral Hopper. She was a, a famous US naval programmer. Um, some people say she invented the term debugging, but that's debatable. What she said was, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to get permission. Now she was actually talking about US naval politics, but you can take the same sentiment and apply it to solving irregular problems. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to get permission. So we'll assume that tasks are not going to get each other's way. If they do, then we'll do something about it. That's quite an unusual thing to say in computer science. We'd like everything to be computer science to be deterministic, to know what's going to happen. Let's just say things can get each other's way, it's not an issue. When we find there's a problem, we'll sort it out. Now that sounds like a little bit of magic. Uh, sorry, I'll carry on talking here. The idea is that um, these shared objects can be accessed by every task. They can all go through them, and instead of saying they will have to stop for one to go through, we'll let them all go through willy-nilly, and we'll just see what happens, and we'll sort out any problems afterwards. So if two tasks conflict with each other, if they try and access the same kind of state as each other, then we need to do something about that. What we'll do is we'll, we'll stop one of the tasks, we'll forget about it, we'll cancel it, and then we'll run it again later. So there was a conflict, and then these two run at the same time. What we want to do is somehow stop one of the tasks and then run it again later, so it's got nothing to complete against. Now, that takes a little bit more time, but we've still got loads of parallelism out of most of them, and then a bit less out of that last one. But that, that's not too bad. It's a lot better than having anything going through one um, shared computation. So that brings up two questions. It sounds like magic. How can you tell when one task gets in the way of another? And how can you cancel a task that's already been running? If you've already drawn half your route onto the board, if you try and take that away somehow, are you going to get in the way of other tasks by trying to delete it? And how do you know when one task is getting in the way of the other if you're just letting them just write to the, the shared state however they like? Well, one solution to this problem is transactional memory. The idea is instead of writing to memory, we're going to write to a log. So instead of all our reads and writes going straight to memory, we'll write them down in a log somewhere. We'll record what you've read, what you've written, and what the values were. And we'll store that in a separate data structure. 
And then we can tell if two tasks are getting in each other's way, if they're conflicting, by simply comparing the logs. Share, search through the logs to see if they're getting in each other's way. And the great thing is we can cancel a task by simply throwing the log away, forgetting about it, pretending it never happened, and nothing's actually happened to memory. All we have to do at the end is actually finish up by writing the, the log to memory when we decide on that task to finish up. So if we have two tasks, these two routes again, they're running at the same time, it looks like they're going to conflict, but we don't know that from the start. So instead of writing the, memory, the results into memory, we'll store them in some log somewhere. And this says what memory access we made and what the values were. We can then search that and find that, wait a minute, these two tasks, they're finished on their own, but they've actually used the same piece of memory. So therefore, we're going to have to throw away one of the tasks, just forget about it, scratch it off, throw away its log, and let the other one write its, the data it produced to memory. And then those tasks get stopped from interfering with each other. And we can rerun this one later um, at some other time, when hopefully it won't conflict with another route. But if the routes don't conflict, so these two routes are not likely to get in each other's way, then they can do their calculations, write to their log, and then we can simply finish off by writing them both in memory. And these two run in parallel without getting in each other's way, and therefore they've been simply allowed to go ahead and write to memory at the end with no problems. And they've run in parallel. So that's great, we've solved the problem. And transactional memory is a, a real technique you can apply today. It's moving from research, as it, has, as it has been over the last decade or so, and it's now being moved into production systems. So there's really good transactional memory support in C, C++, Java. We're working on transactional memory support here at Manchester. We've written a, a library for Scala which implements transactional memory. What's in languages like Clojure and Haskell? It tends to be more functional languages, which have better support for transactional memory, because they control their side effects better, so they're easier to do control in this sort of way. And coming out in the next year or so, there's going to be a real hardware implementation of transaction memory from Intel in their new Haswell processor. Haswell has nothing to do with Haskell, it's a similar name, that's all. So your processor will actually understand the concept of redirecting memory to a log rather than writing it straight to memory. It's going to use the cache system to achieve that effect. So hopefully that will make it nice and fast, nice and simple to use. It'll be in our hardware for real. And the hardware guys are having to solve this problem because they're the people who have given us these multi-cores when we're not really sure about how to program them. So thankfully they've come back to us with these hardware techniques enabling us to try and program them in the future. It's not only about transaction memory. There are other interesting ways to reverse computation. For example, you can do things at a semantic mathematical operator level. If you know you've added x to a value, then you can reverse that computation by subtracting x. If you know you've inserted a node into a graph, you can reverse that computation by removing the graph. And this is where it's really great for you people in your own specific domains, because you know the, the right way to compare the semantics of operators within your domains. If you work in graphics, you know what graphics operations can be reversed or not. And this is what my research is in. I'm trying to find more high-level ways to be intelligent about how you reverse computations, about how you find out when things conflict and try to stop the conflicts in the first place. Transaction memory can be a bit of a blunt tool applied because it's working at the machine word level, at the actual memory reads and writes. So ideally, we'd like to use some of these high-level techniques. There's some fascinating research from the past in the 80s. There's a system with an absolutely amazing name, the Jefferson Time Warp System. And this was a system for reversing computations which are made across a network where you're normally sending packets of messages around. They invented a system of anti-messages that when they collide with their original message, destroy each other and produce more anti-messages to delete those that were created by those messages. And these anti-messages spread throughout the distributed system, reversing computation. It's actually fantastic and it's got a great name. So do we have a solution? It sounds like we've got a system there that's going to sort out our irregular problems really well. Well, there are lots of downsides. Transactional memory can be slow. In the past, the implementations in software have been prohibitively slow. They're getting a lot better, but redirecting all these reads and writes to memories turns each read and write instruction in the processor into hundreds or thousands of instructions. It can be a lot of work. The hardware is probably extremely limited. A hardware implementation is always going to be restricted into how much work it can include, buffers of limited size. So perhaps the hardware support won't really give us much to enable us to solve these larger problems. And generally, perhaps transaction memory isn't the, the magic bullet people thought it was. My own belief is that we need to apply a lot more knowledge about the problems we're solving 
in order to apply a similar approach to transactional memory, but at a higher level. And that's where we need the, the people with the, the, their own domains in computer science who know about what sort of operators they can reverse and what they can't. And then general optimistic execution can be general. We said, can be, sorry, can be wasteful. We said that this whole problem started when we ran out of power, and here we are doing computation that we're simply throwing away at the end of it. So there's a bit of a, a contrast there. Do we want to save power, or don't we? Um, and general, it turns out to be a trade-off in that it's okay to waste this amount of work because you can show that overall it produces a, a solution that's more parallel. And regular problems are billion-dollar questions. They really are. They're the kind of problems that Facebook and Google work on all the time. Um, computer graphics, physical simulations. The other thing about irregularity is that before a, a regular simulation might be less precise because it's constrained to always be as specific as it is. With irregular computations, you can divide things up further and make them more precise in a particular area if they want to be. So a weather simulation can be more precise over a particular area of the country. But that's an irregular problem. Now we're starting to tackle those. We might be better at achieving that sort of thing. The web and social graphs. Now these are $100 billion questions. The kind of data structures that Facebook and Google operate on are very irregular graphs. Um, with nodes being added and removed, people changing around, things changing the whole time. And lots of computations wanting to operate on that same data structure at the same time. Really complicated problems and they're, they're regular and those are the, some of the big problems these companies face. There's also lots of regular problems in machine learning networks and data mining, both big problems that's been lots of money and research being spent on. Um, here it's uh, at Manchester as well, so perhaps there's some stuff we can do to help you paralyse your problems when you find yourself with a, a 32 core processor and your sequential programs not running very fast anymore. Thanks very much. Any questions about my work or a regular parameters? Any questions? So you said that um, the problems of basic geometry of the shared, um, shared data structure, that's an irregular problem. Um, is it just because they have a this they have lots of shared data structures or is there some other irregularity is a sort of pathology. It's something which goes wrong in problems, but it's quite a hard concept to decide, um, to define. I wouldn't say in general that a, an algorithm or a data structure is regular or irregular. People are trying to do that because it's the easy thing to do, but in general it's a, a set of problems that arise. So having shared state generally gives you an irregular problem. Um, having an irregular shaped graph often gives you an irregular problem. And Google have got, in their web graph, they've got a massive data structure that doesn't fit on one computer, Bits of the, the computers it's running on are constantly failing. They're trying to update it at the same time as they're trying to read stuff. Um, it's constantly changing. Because they've got so many people using it at the same time, it gets into an inconsistent state if you're not careful. Um, so those are the sort of things which generally build up to be a pathology of problems which I'm calling a regular and can be solved using these sort of irregular techniques. So you, you talked about transactional memory as a, as a uh, proposed solution for solving these irregular problems. Yeah. And you said there are a lot of irregular problems in Facebook, Google, and Facebook. Do you know of any big companies who have decided to try and use transactional memory to solve these problems? Those larger companies tend to be using a higher level of abstraction. So Google produces lots of their own systems. They produce MapReduce originally to try and tackle some of these problems. But MapReduce is quite a regular system. Everything gets put through in these big batches. And they've realized the problems with that, so they've developed future systems you may want to look up that are really interesting, such as Percolator or Pragle in processing these problems. And they've got similar sort of ideas in some of them about optimistic execution, trying to solve the problem of little things want to change in a big data structure and how do you handle that. Um, so Google and Facebook are doing the, the idea of they're going to make their own domain specific solutions for their, their big domain specific problems. That's because they've got lots of money to do it. They've got the experts. Um, somebody who's trying to write a machine learning algorithm doesn't know anything about parallelism. It's going to find these problems as well when they get themselves a 32 raw machine. They're trying to run using any kind of proportion of the parallelism available in that machine. And they'll want to because potentially each core is going to get less performance or uh, the best case is going to stay the same or get a lot, will get faster, a lot slower than it used to be. Used to process getting faster and faster and faster and solving all our problems. That's not likely to happen anymore. It just it just struck me as odd that you said that companies have 
lot of money by Google are doing the transactional memory and some abstraction when you think they don't just have the money to put it into hardware, which would get rid of the sort of time speaking. Google stuff. like to use commodity hardware. And they like to use their own systems on top of that. I mean, when Haswell comes out, it's possible that within each compute node, people like Google might want to use transactional memory. Um, but you can't use transactional memory easily across distributed systems. It's a much more complicated problem. So people often find they like to use the regular parallelism system between compute nodes. And within a compute node, they solve problems using a regular parallelism. Because a distributed system is a bit more regular. But when you've got shared memory, you find more of those pathological cases where you'd like to use the technique for a regular parallelism. So um, in your research, you were talking about, uh, you, you spoke about moving towards uh, lifting this concept of transaction memory, transaction memory at the layer, yeah. uh, using more abstract notion of undoing operations. Yeah. Uh, it strikes me that these operations are going to be more expensive at a higher level. Um, do you think you'd just be moving the expense upwards, in a sense? I think they'll be a lot cheaper, because of when you do things on a machine word level, You've got a lot of stuff in there you're not actually interested in. So temporary variables, you wrote to a temporary data structure, that gets all logged. Stuff like that you don't need. If you can just record the single information of, I inserted a node here, you need, to, you need to remove it afterwards, then that's very easy to log. All you have to do is put one entry in the log. And then the, the rare case where things get aborted and we have to undo them, then we can then worry about the cost of that operation. But typically, we think things aren't going to conflict. When you do these algorithm, the circuit routing examples, the routes don't often conflict. It's just they may always conflict. So you'd like to have as little information stuck in the log as possible. It's almost like you're writing it, forget about it. So I oh, insert a note here, remember that for later. That's a lot easier than, in than instrumenting every single read and write that your processor does. So it should be faster if we do it at a high level semantic level. So it's about, about uh, the common case. Yeah, we'd like to be on a critical path that's easy. And it matches up the whole other philosophy in that we'd like to do the easy way, forget about the problems. When we get problems, then we'll deal with them at the expense of case on the problem. Because if you're if you're undoing an operation, you've already ruined your, your cash, you know, you've already got rid of you're already starting again. So it doesn't matter if things are expensive then particularly. Okay, any other questions? Thanks very much, Chris.